I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Mrs. Bertha Flowers was the aristocrat of black stamps. She had the grace of control to appear warm in the coldest weather, and on the Arkansas summer days it seemed she had a private breeze which swirled around, cooling her. She was thin without the tote look of wiry people, and her printed volet dresses and flowered hats were as right for her as denim overalls for a farmer. She was our side's answer to the richest white woman in town. Her skin was a rich black that would have peeled like a plum if snagged, but then no one would have thought of getting close enough to Mrs. Flowers to ruffle her dress, let alone snag her skin. She didn't encourage familiarity. She wore gloves, too. I don't think I ever saw Mrs. Flowers laugh, but she smiled often. A slow widening of her thin black lips to show even small white teeth, then the slow, effortless closing. When she chose to smile on me, I always wanted to thank her. The action was so graceful and inclusively benign. She was one of the few gentle women I have ever known and has remained throughout my life the measure of what a human being can be. Mama had a strange relationship with her. Most often when she passed on the road in front of the store, she spoke to Mama in that soft yet carrying voice. Good day, Mrs. Henderson. Mama responded with, How are you, Sister Flowers? Mrs. Flowers didn't belong to our church, nor was she Mama's familiar. Why on earth did she insist on calling her Sister Flowers? Shame made me want to hide my face. Mrs. Flowers deserved better than to be called Sister. Then Mama left out the verb. Why not ask, How are you, Mrs. Flowers? With the unbalanced passion of the young, I hated her for showing her ignorance to Mrs. Flowers. It didn't occur to me for many years that they were as like as sisters, separated only by formal education. Although I was upset, neither of the women was in the least shaken by what I thought an unceremonious greeting. Mrs. Flowers would com continue her easy gait up the hill to her little bungalow, and Mama kept on shelling peas or doing whatever had brought her to the front porch. Occasionally, though, Mrs. Flowers would drift off the road and down to the store, and Mama would say to me, Sister, you go on and play. As I left, I would hear the beginning of an intimate conversation, Mama persistently using the wrong verb or none at all. Brother and Sister Wilcox is surely the meanest. Is, Mama? Is? Oh, please not is, Mama, for two or more. But they talked, and from the side of the building where I waited for the ground to open up and swallow me, I heard the soft voice Mrs. Flowers and the textured voice of my grandmother merging and melting. They were interrupted from time to time by giggles that must have come from Mrs. Flowers. Mama never giggled in her life. Then she was gone. She appealed to me because she was like people I had never met personally. Like women in English novels who walked the moors, whatever they were, with their loyal dogs racing at a respectful distance. Like the women who sat in front of roaring fireplaces drinking tea incessantly from silver trays full of scones and crumpets. Women who walked over the hearth and read Morocco-bound books and had two last names divided by a hyphen. It would be safe to say that she made me proud to be Negro just by being herself. She acted just as refined as white folks in the movies and books, and she was more beautiful, for none of them could have come near that warm color without looking gray by comparison. It was fortunate that I never saw her in the company of poor white folks, for since they tend to think of their whiteness as an evenizer, I'm certain that I would have had to hear her spoken to commonly as Bertha, and my image of her would have shattered like the unmendable Humpty Dumpty. One summer afternoon, sweet milk fresh in my memory, she stopped at the store to buy provisions. Another Negro woman of her health and age would have been expected to carry the paper sacks home in one hand, but Mama said, Sister Flowers, I'll send Bailey up to you house with those things. She smiled that slow, dragging smile. Thank you, Mrs. Henderson. I'd prefer Marguerite, though. My name was beautiful when she said it. 
I've been meaning to talk to her anyway. They gave each other age group looks. Mama said, well, that's all right then, sister. Go and change your dress. You going to Sister Flowers. Shifo's robe was a maze. What on earth did one put on to go to Mrs. Flowers' house? I knew I shouldn't put on a Sunday dress. It was might be sacrilegious. Certainly not a house dress, since I was already wearing a fresh one. I chose a school dress, naturally. It was formal without suggesting that going to Mrs. Flowers' house was equivalent to attending church. I trusted myself back into the store. Now don't you look nice. I had chosen the right thing for once. Mrs. Henderson, you make most of the children's clothes, don't you? Yes, ma'am, sure do. Store-bought clothes ain't hardly worth the thread it take to stitch them. I'll say you do a lovely job, though so neat. That dress looks professional. Mama was enjoying the seldom received compliments. Since everyone we knew, except Mrs. Flowers, of course, could sew competently, praise was hardly handed out for the commonly practiced craft. I try with the help of the Lord, Sister Flowers, to finish the inside just like I does the outside. Come here, Sister. I had buttoned up the collar and tied the belt apron-like and back. Mama told me to turn around. With one hand, she pulled the strings, and the belt fell free at both sides of my waist. Then her large hands were at my neck, opening the button loops. I was terrified. What was happening? Take it off, Sister. She had her hands on the hem of the dress. I don't need to see in the inside, Mrs. Henderson. I can tell. But the dress was over my head and my arms were stuck in the sleeves. Mama said, that'll do. See here, Sister Flowers, I've French seams around the armholes. Though the cloth film, I saw the shadow approach. That makes it last longer. Children these days would bust out of sheet metal clothes. They're so rough. That is a very good job, Mrs. Henderson. You should be proud. You can put your dress back on, Marguerite. No, ma'am, pride is a sin, and according to the good book, it goeth before a fall. That's right, so the Bible says. It's a good thing to keep in mind. I wouldn't look at either of them. Mama hadn't thought that taking off my dress in front of Mrs. Flowers would kill me stone dead. Mrs. Flowers had known that I would be embarrassed, and that was even worse. I picked up the groceries and went out to wait in the hot sunshine. It would be fitting if I got a sunstroke and died before they came outside. Just dropped dead on the slanting porch. There was a little path beside the rocky road, and Mrs. Flowers walked in front, swinging her arms and picking her way over the stones. She said, without turning her head to me, I hear you're doing very good schoolwork, Marguerite, but that it's all written. The teachers report that they have trouble getting you to talk in class. We passed the triangular farm on our left, and the path widened to allow us to walk together. I hung back in the separate, unasked and unanswerable questions. Come and walk along with me, Marguerite. I couldn't have refused even if I wanted to. She pronounced my name so nicely, or more correctly, she spoke each word with such clarity that I was certain a foreigner who didn't understand English could have understood her. No one is going to make you talk. Possibly no one can. But bear in mind, language is man's way of communicating with his fellow man, and it is language alone which separates him from the lower animals. That was a totally new idea to me, and I would need time to think about it. Your grandmother says you read a lot. Every chance you get. That's good, but not good enough. Words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with the shades of deeper meaning. I memorized the part about the human voice infusing words. It seemed so valid and poetic.